God's word says he himself gives life and breath to everything and he satisfies every need. How blessed we are to have a God who provides every need. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to all RLC families and guests. Happy Palm Sunday. <laughs> uh, we are so happy that you joined us today and we hope that you, are, you and your families are healthy and doing well. Those of you joining us from home, we thank you and are blessed to have you with us. Uh, those of you in the sanctuary, you may be seated. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Eric Furbeck. 246 months ago <laughs> today, my beautiful wife, Erica, walked into my life. Literally, like she walked into my office at work. I'm trying to do my work at the end of the day, and she's like in the doorway, hey. <laughs> and I was like... Hey. <laughs> um, she invited me to Resurrection Life Church soon after that day, and the rest is history. It didn't take long until I joined the usher ministry here, where 
I've served in a leadership role for many years since. Um, I have otherwise uh, made myself available as I've been led and had the, had the privilege of uh, raising a family here in, in this church and watching two children uh, grow to the point of being active uh, participants in the Quest Youth Ministry and serving in the Res Kids Rainforest Ministry where they were once nurtured in God's Word. If you're joining us here for the first time, uh, we're so glad you chose to join us. Um, when you walked in, you got a, a welcome brochure. If you would please fill out the form. Uh, there's a slip there that if you could take that to the Welcome Center off the foyer after service, we have a special gift we'd like to give to you. Also, if anyone here has a prayer request on the back of that form, there's also a place where you can uh, share with us your prayer needs. If you would put those in the offering stands on the way out or give it to an usher or you can take that to the Welcome Center. Uh, that would be great. Um, a reminder that all of our announcements can be found on the church app, Twitter, and on Facebook. Um, ladies, you may have already noticed in the lobby there, there is a poster in the foyer about the Women's More Than Conquerors Day uh, with Yvonne Conte. I was told that you can register starting today. You can grab one of these and take them with you to remind you that's on May 21st. All right, who's ready for VBS? For those of you who haven't been blessed to uh, have the opportunity to be involved with Vacation Bible School in the past, what a blessing it is. It seems like a lot of work and a little sacrifice uh, to, uh, at first, but by the time it's all over, man, it seems like we're the ones being blessed the most. So if you want to be a, uh, be a blessing to others and in turn be blessed, uh, there's an informational meeting on April, after second service on April 24th. Don't miss out on this great opportunity. We'd like to say thank you so much for your generosity for giving to RLC each week. As a reminder, there are various ways to, to give. You can do so by mailing it in, using our giving stations as you exit the sanctuary. You can do so online at our website, and you can do so on our church app. Your giving is so, so appreciated as it allows us not only to deliver God's word here in the sanctuary and via uh, well, online, um, but also allows us to reach out as a church uh, to various local, regional, national, and international ministries that we participate, that we support. All right, so I have an offering reflection. Some of you may be familiar with some of what I'm going to say next. It is a bit testimonial in nature, but I haven't shared it with you folks in a few years, and some of you weren't here back then. Uh, we have a lot of new faces since then. So I'm blessed to share this reflection with you again for the first time. Many of you know that old childhood bedtime prayer, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Well, that was about the extent of my Christianity as a very young child. What a blessing that little prayer was, however, given the volatile environment I grew up around. Most of my immediate adult influences I grew up around back then were unsaved and often involved in illegal drug use or other illicit endeavors. A bigger blessing came to me in the mail one day as a nine-year-old. It was a Bible study directed towards someone my age. It lured me with a few popular stories from the Bible, offered a few questions, which I answered and returned in the mail for a grade and received the next chapter, usually within a week or two. I gladly followed the guidance uh, to, well, I'm sorry, after a number of chapters, it transitioned into a salvation prayer. I gladly followed the guidance and found a quiet corner and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ in my heart as my Lord and Savior. Surprisingly, one of my loved ones, though they were incarcerated, serving, jail for a few, serving time in jail for a few years, was the one responsible for sending that Bible study to me. Because of the obedient, prayerful consideration by this individual, I had a conviction throughout my childhood and adolescence which I believe helped, me keep, helped keep me from reproducing some of the same setbacks that my family members and neighborhood had kind of gotten themselves wrapped up in. I've now been saved for 38 years. I've been able to be a positive Christian influence to my friends, family, daughters, and folks that I run into every day at work and in the community. And now I have the privilege of speaking to you fine people. What an impact this has had on my life and potentially many others. You guys might be thinking, what does this have to do with the offering? Well, the Bible tells us a story 
of the widow's offering in both Mark and Luke. In Luke 21, verse 1 through 4, it states, While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, the poor widow has given more than all of the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. Most of us are blessed with a means beyond that which the widow possessed. With prayerful, obedient consideration, we could have a huge impact as we offer our time, talents, and gifts. Um, in, in, especially if we do so with the relative generosity of the widow. Some of us aren't so far off of the widow's circumstances, as was the case of the loved one who sent the uh, Bible study for me with all they had to offer in jail. But with that same prayerful obedient consideration and relative generosity, we can have the same impact, if not greater. Last week in this sanctuary, and via Facebook Live and YouTube, of course, we heard God speaking. He sounded a lot like Pastor Jeff. Points regarding spending versus investing were brought up. We were advised that when we spend our lives doing stuff, it doesn't really follow us. It's just something that's done and it's behind us. When we invest our lives, it goes ahead of you to heaven. When we invest our lives, I'm sorry, with whatever we have to offer with our, from our time, talents, and gifts, however, great or small, let's be investors in God's work so we can have a heavenly impact in the lives of others and ourselves. Let us pray over the offering we present for the Lord's good work today. Father God, we thank you for all the blessings and opportunities you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. We in turn understand we are blessed to be a blessing. However big or small our offerings may be perceived, we present them to you with generous hearts. We pray and proclaim that our offering will produce a tremendous impact. We love you and give you all the praise and glory as we have the opportunity to invest in your good work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, I'd like to dismiss any children that are in the sanctuary from kindergarten through sixth grade, if you'd like to join the Reds kids on the right. If there are any youth, you can join Quest, of course. The rest of us, if we can have you stand up and give each other a good morning greeting. Well, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing today on this Palm Sunday? Awesome. Welcome, everybody, online. Um, hope you enjoy the service. Thank you for being here. Get your coffee. Hope you enjoy today's service. So, for those who don't know me, my name is Dave Parker, Jr. I am the head usher here. I've been for many years. Um, it's my privilege that I get today the opportunity to share the message with you. As you see, Pastor Jeff is not here. He had a successful procedure on his back. So, absolutely, amen. So, so be praying for his continued healing. And Pastor, if you're watching, we love you. We are praying for you and rest. <laughs> absolutely. So Palm Sunday, right? Um, what an awesome, you know, they welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem. Um, they would call him king, but then... Moments later, they would say, crucify him. But aren't we glad that he rose and saved us from our sins so that we could live, huh? Amen. Amen. Well, this message, I think, is going to challenge you in the way that you think when you say things to each other. Um, not only the effects that it has on other people, but I'm going to share some personal things that have impacted my own life. Some of these things are very special to me. Um, they 
are just great moments in my life. And I hope that you see that God has a plan in all of it. My goal is to communicate just how important the words we speak and how important they are and the power that they have. And if we use them correctly, not only will we honor God, but we will build up each other as well in the process. So, but before I get into it, let's just pray and invite God. Lord, I just thank you and praise you for this opportunity. I thank you that um, your will would be done here, that Holy Spirit would uh, use me as its vessel to communicate uh, this message. I thank you, Lord, that we would walk out better than we came. I thank you, Lord, that we would be encouraged, that we would definitely monitor uh, the power of our words and how if we do, God will move in mighty ways. I just thank you and praise you uh, for what, not only what you're going to do in this service, but in future services and anybody else that comes up to this podium uh, to deliver a message. We thank you, we praise you, and we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I believe that one of the greatest gifts God has ever given me is the ability to communicate using words. It's something that has kind of come easy to me. Um, most guys I know sometimes don't communicate well, but I don't seem to have a problem with that. <laughs> now, if you ask my teachers in school, they'll tell you that, you know, he, I talked a little too much when I should have been paying attention, but I just, that's my excuse for saying I just had a lot to say. But um, sometimes it's the very thing that got me in trouble. Um, can you relate? <laughs> so our ability to use words to communicate allows us to build relationships, um, create businesses, you know, work a job, play sports, and sometimes even help organize a church, right? So we constantly are communicating <clears throat> to, to create a goal or to achieve a goal. But there are times when our words aren't very kind. They are unloving. They can be selfish, arrogant, and sometimes prideful. So how we use these words are important. If they're not important, why would the God allow the Bible to be created, right? He uses his word to, let, you know, tell us about his character, about how he used the different people that followed him. So it's, he definitely wanted to speak to us in a story format because he knew we would understand. But don't we love our stories, right? We're, we're so captured by the good versus evil or the romantic, right? We got to rescue the beauty. Um, and there's so many different quotes from these movies that I mean, I love quotes. I have stuff pinned up in my office all over, some scriptures, some from movies. Um, one of my favorites is Forrest Gump, right? And, and, and what does Forrest say? Mama says, life's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get, right? That's, that's popular scripture. But isn't it true? Like, you live life the best we can, but we don't really know what's going to happen to us or what we're going to go through, but we just try to you know, do the best we can. So there's some definitely wisdom in Forrest Gump. How about Rocky? I love the story of Rocky. Am I the only one? <laughs> My wife's like, why do you keep watching that? I'm like, come on. Rocky is like a, he was a nobody. He got a title shot. And because he didn't give up, he, like everybody loved him, right? Rocky was the same guy whether he was rich or poor. How can you not like Rocky? So listen to what Rocky says. One of the quotes from his movies is, remember the mind is your best muscle. Big arms can move rocks, but big words can move mountains. So see, even Rocky knew there was important to the words that we speak. Now, I don't know about all you Marvel comic book or movie buffs. I'm a big superhero guy, Spider-Man. Now, I will confess, I'm an Incredible Hulk guy. Just saying. But Spider-Man had some wisdom too. And if, you've ever, if you know that story a little bit, remember his uncle Ben said to him, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, Uncle Ben knew some stuff too. <laughs> but absolutely right. I mean, with much is given, much is required. So there's definitely some wisdom in that. And, and these are movies that we love, right? But I think if we're going to do this some justice, we have to start when word, the first word was first spoken, 
right? So we have to go back to Genesis. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 in the New King James Version. And God, right off the bat, says, let there be light. Now remember, the earth was dark and empty at this time, and God had a plan to fill it. Now, he creates light, but then in verse 3, he says, let there be light, and there was light. Now, God spoke the light into existence. So there we see the power of what we say, right? In verse 4, he calls the light day, and he called the darkness night. So now he's making a distinction between the two. In the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 in the New King James, Jesus uses that word light again, but this time with a little different meaning. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. So now, what is he talking about? Now I think he's talking about us as his followers being that light, taking a little bit of him so that people see us, so that we stand out, right? God wants to reveal his truth through us. So he's looking to do his work in each one of us. Let me give you an example. Have you ever heard somebody say, man, I just hate my job, right? We've said that out of frustration. You know, these coworkers are, you know, getting on my nerve. Whether, whatever excuse it is, whether you don't get along with your boss, it's frustration nonetheless. But consider this. Just like God spoke the light into an earth that was dark, sometimes he places his light at a job where he sees there's dark. So the light that you bring overwhelms the darkness. See, sometimes we tend to see it in our own light, but we don't look at it through God's eyes. There's a reason why he's placed you there. Just a thought. I believe that this is done on purpose. So when we bring, so that we will bring God everywhere with us and hopefully others see it and want some of him too. God clearly uses spoken words to his advantage to create and build up people, and we're going to discuss that. The Bible is just a book of words that tells us of God's character and, it, and how others have walked with him and how we were, they were impacted. It shows his desires, his commandments, and his love for his followers. Words have great power. And can, and when spoken, cannot be taken back. So we must think before we speak. I mean, m- most of us have said some things that weren't very honoring, but, you know, we definitely have to monitor that. Words can also bring division. So just like words can bring light and value, they can also bring division. And we start to see that in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 in the NIV. Now, I'm not going to read all of that, but here, what's important is, here's where we see Satan encounter Eve, and he asks her a question, right, because he wants to see what she knows. So here's where the power of words comes in handy, because we can use words to manipulate when we have an agenda. So he says to Eve, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree? So he's testing Eve, right? So he's, in other words, he's basically saying, did God really say that? Well, the serpent is trying to raise doubt in Eve, making her think God said something different. Well, how do we know that? Well, if we go to verse 4, the serpent continues his lie and says, you will not surely die, for God knows that in a day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, that is implying God isn't telling Eve the truth, and that God is hiding something from her. So you see what he does? Very masterful at trying to manipulate his way. And sometimes we do the same thing. Now, To know what was originally said, we have to go to chapter 2 in Genesis, 16 through 17. And God says, if you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, 
But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. So you see, you change some words around in a sentence, changes the whole meaning of the sentence. And unfortunately, there was a negative result that came out of that. And that result was Eve ended up eating the fruit. She wasn't supposed to. Adam, in turn, ate it. And if you study that out, Adam was actually in dominion of the garden at that time. And they both ended up being removed from the Garden of Eden because of disobedience. So it's important to know what God said so that you follow it to the letter. Amen? The issue of this whole speaking words is what we say we will have. And one day, we will answer to God for what we spoke, whether it was good or bad. Do you ever notice how sometimes you'll hear people always talk about, oh, I'm sick, oh, I'm sick. Well, if you say it enough times, whether you're sick, whether you're poor, whether you're whatever, you'll eventually start to believe it. So you have to monitor the things that you speak over yourself and others. There's definitely power there. <clears throat> See, what comes out of our mouth is an indicator of what is in our heart. And that's mentioned in Luke chapter 6, verses 45 in the New King James Version. It actually says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth evil, or brings forth good, and evil out of the treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. I remember last um, September, I gave uh, a message on the condition of your heart. See, we're some of good and bad experiences, and if you don't monitor that bad stuff, eventually it comes out through your speech. And you don't want to speak, again, that, that type of negativity over yourself. See, I don't know about you, but when I first heard this scripture, it really grabbed me. Um, Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 through 37, and the New King James says, but I say to you, and this is Jesus talking, for every idle word men speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified, or by your words, you will be condemned. Now that sounds rough. <laughs> like, if words don't mean anything, why would we have to account for them on the day of judgment? So clearly, God, is, he, he really takes words into account. Because he's saying, you're either, by what you say, you're either going to be innocent or guilty. Okay, you got my attention. <laughs> See, I know I have said many things over the years out of sarcasm, anger, or just trying to be funny. But I've learned that you have to be careful because words can really hurt someone. And I'm learning to think before I speak. Another word that's mentioned quite a bit in Scripture um, the Bible talks about the tongue. Um, that little muscle in our mouth, you know, that gets us in trouble. So, and any time I've learned that God repeats things, he's like, pay attention. You might want to check this out. <laughs> so in Proverbs 18.21, again, in the New King James, he says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So, he, he, God's even going a little further. Now you're innocent or guilty, but it's life or death. What are you speaking over you and your situations or the people that you love? Words can either be uplifting or used to destroy, but we have to choose how we use them. We want to sow positive seed so that we reap a positive harvest because we are going to reap what we sow. The tongue is unique because it helps us pronounce words so that when we speak, it's clear. Because if we didn't have a tongue, you would make noise, but nobody would understand what you're saying. So it clearly has a function. I think the more time that we spend with God, the better chance we have to speak life into our lives and not death. Now, I'm going to go through some scriptures um, I'm going to go slow because there's a lot of scriptures that God specifically talks about our speech. It starts in Proverbs 4, 24 in the NLT, where he says, avoid all perverse talk. Please, or stay away from corrupt speech. 
Proverbs 8.13 in the NLT says, All who fear the Lord will hate evil. Therefore, I hate pride and arrogance, corruption and perverse speech. Proverbs 12.6 in the New Living Translation says, The words of the wicked are like a murderous ambush, but the words of the godly save lives. In Proverbs 12, 18 in the NLT, it says, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Now, what is perverse speech? Well, anytime we're speaking negatively, maybe it's lies, maybe it's gossip, maybe it's telling an inappropriate joke. You know, there's gonna be a lot of things that we could say that aren't honoring to either people or God, and that's the things that we have to be aware of. And God will help us. If we're going to bring people to be to Jesus, or if we're gonna be that witness that we're called to be, we really need to control our tongue so that we have a positive impact on those who need it. Because let's be honest, we hear a lot of negative stuff with what's going on in the world today. You know, one thing I've learned throughout my adult life is the right word at the right time can change the course of somebody's life forever. This is a story I'm going to share. This is actually a football story. So it's not one that I'm real enthused about talking about, but when I get into it, you'll understand why. (laughs) So at the age of 24, I played for um, a semi-pro amateur, you know, semi-pro amateur league the team I played for was called the Mohawk Valley Vikings. I think they're called the Yard Dogs now or something. So I had a blast playing. I played from 24 to 28, um, built a lot of great friendships, um, had a blast. Um, we used to play right over there at the old RFA. Um, and this particular game, we were playing a team from Schenectady, and they weren't that good, I'll be honest. But <laughs> we were winning pretty handedly. Now. Um, I was a starting running back, but um, this was probably the worst game I've ever played in my life. And for those of you who may not know football or understand it, let me quickly explain. So as the running back, it's my job to carry the ball into the end zone to score a touchdown. So now if I'm carrying the ball and I happen to get hit and I lose the ball, we call that a fumble or a turnover. Well... This particular game, I uh, had a problem holding on to the ball. And uh, yeah, it was not good. (laughs) So how many fumbles do you think I had? One, two, uh, let's put it this way. I had so many, I'm surprised the coach didn't kick me out out the game. I had five. And I lost three of them. Yeah, not good. And it even hurts to this day. If it wasn't for transparency, I would never tell the story. <laughs> so, yeah. So basically, I was frustrated. I there's I felt like I was I was losing confidence in myself. I know the players were like, "Get this dude out of here." I don't care if we're winning or not; he's got to go. Uh, but. I was just struggling, and no matter what I did, I just couldn't seem to hold on to the ball. So out of frustration, I says, all right, that's it. I'm done. The, the, after the fifth one, I went to the bench and says, coach, put somebody else in. I'm, I'm hurting the team. Well, people were like, wow, it's not like Dave to have a meltdown like this. Hey, it is what it is. <laughs> so I go to the bench, but I wasn't prepared for what I would ha- would happen next. As I'm sitting there soaking in my misery, one of my teammates comes over and he says, Dave, we started this game with you and we're going to end it with you. So when offense comes back up, get ready. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Right? But you talk about the right word at the right time. Like the message to me when he said that was, we're not going to quit on you. Like that's huge. Right? Who doesn't want to hear that? And the, you know, when we're, when we're frustrated and life is really dealing with us, you need somebody to pick you up in that moment. Well, that's exactly what they did to me that day. I mean, it gave me the confidence to go back in the game. Um, I, I did hold on to the ball. <laughs> so we ended up winning. But, 
You know, God knew what I needed when I needed it. And I think that's the point. So when people are down, pick people up with your words. That was the message I got from that. So why are words important to God? Well, I think because they don't just reveal information, but they will have a good or negative impact. See, words can build trust. They can build confidence. They can communicate value, or they can heal emotional wounds. And we'll talk about that. See, words you, uh, we use words as tools, but just like any tool, it can be misused. As children of God, it's our choice to change how we speak to each other so that we can grow spiritually and closer to God. Our words should bring people closer to God, not farther away. God wants unity, love, kindness, and joy to rule our lives. But that is only possible if we have faith in him and we submit to his commands. Proverbs chapter 16, verses 24 in the New King James says, Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Now, when I first read that, I was like, man, that's, I've never heard it quite put that way. That sounds kind of nice, right? So I started to look into what they really meant when he was talking about that. Well, pleasant words are like a honeycomb. What is a honeycomb? Where the bees store the honey. Honey is sweet, right? So that makes sense. Pleasant words are sweet when we hear them. Because think about how you feel when somebody says something nice to you. You feel good, right? They're communicating value. It's supposed to bring you up. Well, honey actually has healing properties. So when it says health to the bones, healing, it, honey is a non-infla- non-inflammatory. It helps heal burns. It has antioxidants. It helps with sinus and nasal issues. So God knew what he was talking about. It, it clearly is healthy for us. So, you know, there's, there's always wisdom in everything God says. You just have to, you know, study it out. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, verses 4, in the NLT, it further says, Gentle words are a tree of life. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Now here again, you know, we talk about saying negative things damages our spirit or somebody's spirit. So we want to definitely speak life. I will tell you that I'm convinced that there are several things that I've crushed with my own words. But I work every day to intentionally change that by monitoring what I say before I say it. Now, this is funny because I remember my mother saying this next statement to us all the time as kids. And I told her that when she heard this, she'd probably laugh. But how many people used to hear, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all, right? We used to hear that all the time from my mom. And boy, was there wisdom in that. If it's not honoring or if it's not going to lift somebody up, don't keep it to yourself. <laughs> so with that statement, it actually reminds me of another story that a friend of mine had shared where... Um, he was talking to his wife, and she, she made a comment about one of her body parts to him that was negative. And it kind of took him by surprise. And he's like, oh, where, like, where'd that come from? She's like, well, my dad used to say that when I was young. And I thought to myself, oh, man, like my heart kind of... Because as fathers especially, like what we say to, in a negative light to our son or our daughter or our wife, as far as their appearance, is a no-no because it directly affects how they see themselves. You know, and and this isn't in my notes, I just want to say this, that women have enough garbage to deal with that the the world says that they should look like this, if they, they gotta get surgeries. Listen, Dave Parker's here to tell you that's a lie from the pit of hell. God made you wonderfully and beautifully made. You are just fine. So, yeah, we definitely have to not say that type of stuff. Um, Encourage your wife, your son, or your daughter, and watch God bring out the best in them. One morning, um, I was doing uh, 
both services. And that particular day, um, if anybody has ever done announcements or anything like that, sometimes it's tough because, you know, we're not polished speakers. We want to get up here. We know we're honoring God. We want to do the best that we can. So, you know, that particular day that I did them, I was a little nervous. So I'm like, man, you know, a little off my game. You know, I don't know if I was not talking, you know, in the right tone. Maybe I was going a little fast. But um, Jeremy Roberts happened to be sitting in the seat or the row before me. So as I came down off the podium, I think Jeremy picked up on it a little bit. And uh, if you've ever encountered Jeremy, he's wonderful. He, he just such a love for God and everything. But as I sat down, you know, Jeremy turns around to me, he says, Dave, there's no need to be nervous. You know everybody here. Just be you. I looked and I was like, yeah, that sounds good. And all of a sudden, like, this huge weight, like, lifted off of my shoulders, right? And I'm thinking, yeah, just be you. So I go up there to second service, just be you. You know, everything is smooth. The right word at the right time is crucial. And when people are up here, I, I think we all secretly are cheering for each other. And we say, great job. Hey, you're doing Because that's what we need, right? To, to do the best for God, we need encouragement. And that's exactly what... Jeremy did for me. So if he's watching or listening, thank you, brother. It, God knew what I needed, and I got it for sure. God uses words because he knows they are necessary for communication and instruction to help us become what we're called to be and do, and that's important. I say that because... Some of you spoke that I would be up here, Mary Fisher. <clears throat> so that's a huge encouragement when you speak something into somebody's life and the next thing you know, they're doing it. You know that that person heard from God and that, if that doesn't encourage you, you're probably not alive, right? But the reason why this message was so easy for me is because the reason why I'm up here is because people believed in me. Somebody didn't give up, and people, my parents constantly spoke good things over us as kids. And when you know that's how you got here, it's the, it's, you're just humbled by it. <clears throat> I want to share one last story, and this story is an emotional one. Um, it's, a, it's one of those defining moments in your life when you know God says exactly what you needed to hear. Um, one Sunday, like most Sundays, we go to eat after church. We usually see some of you out at the restaurant. So. <laughs> um, so we're at this particular restaurant, and we're with, I'm with my wife and my mom and my dad. And, you know, we're having a good meal, and we always have good conversation. Well, this particular day, you know, we're leaving, and we're walking to our car, and all of a sudden, my dad turns to me and says something that I will never forget as long as I live. He said to me, you know I'm proud of the man you've become, right? Yeah. I was like, wow. Like, I just get goosebumps saying that, and I already did, this is the second service. And I thought, hold it together, don't cry. <laughs> when you're a young man who's newly married, who has a family, you're trying to live the best way according to God. Like, to hear that is like a game changer. Like, what man doesn't want to hear that from his father? And I thought to myself, I mean, I looked at my wife and my mom. They had tears in their eyes. I was like, wow, this is a moment. I don't even know what to say. And I looked at my dad and I said, thank you. But here's what I want to say to my dad, who's going through his own things. Not every man gets to hear, um, I'm proud of the man you've become. But you know what? I'm proud of the man he's become. And it's because <clears throat> I saw him sacrifice, go to work every day. I saw him go out of town. I saw him work long hours. And I saw him do the best he could for his kids. He raised four pretty decent children and is married to a wife of over 40 years. So you know what, Dad? 
I'm proud of the man you've become because you set the tone. I didn't get plan. I didn't plan on getting choked up, but it is what it is. But no, the right. That's why I say the right word at the right time. I mean, when he said that to me, I felt like I was a superhero and just saved the world from destruction. I mean, I all of a sudden I stood up a little straighter. I felt like there was an S here. The the cape was just not visible, right? Like holy cow! I'll just never forget that moment and. When you speak something like that into somebody's life, it makes all the difference. And it helped me go in the direction of God, for sure. So, you know, what we say, take the time to monitor what you say. I mean, because it's it can mean the difference between your kids or your wife or whoever you're talking to going to the next level. Um, I really hope this message was an encouragement. I hope that you share this message with people. Um, I hope that you realize that we have a part to play in building God's kingdom. And what we say to each other is part of it. God's, God will help us say the right things. But if we need to give him access and allow him to change us from the inside out. If this message touched your heart, give you a little nudge, And you don't have the Lord as your life, as your savior, because he is our life. Then the answer is simple. I'll walk you through a prayer and we can confirm that you'll be a child of God forever. This is too important. All the years that I've gone to this church over 30 years, and this is what I'm doing, it's important. So does anybody wanna say this prayer? Maybe even you online. If you feel a need, hey, I'll, I'll go through this prayer. We can walk through this prayer together. So how about this? Heavenly Father, I ask you to come into my life. I realize I need a Savior. And I ask you to forgive the sins I've committed against you. I ask you to be Lord of my life from this day forward. Thank you for saving me and making me a new creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. So you hear all these people clapping, right? That's a celebration. If you've made that commitment for the very first time and you're online, please let us know. I mean, go to reslifeny.org. Um, you can write to us, go on the website, tell, you know, tell somebody, even if you're in the congregation, tell an usher, somebody you came with, this is a celebration. You are now a citizen of heaven and that's the beginning of your life. And I'm telling you from a man whose life was changed 30 years ago, it's a, it's a big deal. So um, again, when you walk out of here, just share this. Don't let it go. I mean, I, I, I shared this stuff from my heart because I knew it was that important, right? I'm going to pray before we dismiss, but I want to pray specifically for us that we change our speech so that it glorifies God and it brings more people to us. Amen? All right. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for everybody online who's watching, and I thank you for everybody in this sanctuary that this message would change us, that this message would bring us to the next level, that we would monitor what we say to people and that it would bring people to Christ. I thank you, Lord, that it's not our will, but it's your will. And I just thank you, Lord, that we would use our words to speak life and not death, that our words would penetrate those hardened hearts that are out there, that we would turn those hearts as into hearts of, for God. I just thank you and praise you, and I hope that each and every person here is blessed throughout the week. Um, I just thank you, Lord, for Jesus, not only what you've done in this service, but what you're going to do with future services and the people who are going to stand up here next week. I thank you, I praise you, and I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a great weekend, and enjoy your Palm Sunday.